Good morning. Welcome to Christian Companions. Uh, if you are new with us, this is a 1030 Sunday school class uh, that normally meets 1030 on Sundays. But as the time we're in, we can't really meet. So we are doing this online. So if you're with us, we're going through a book. Feel free to stick around, though, because we'll read through scripture and I'll read from commentary and kind of teach along. If you want the book, let me know. Uh, I'll let you know some details about how you can find me later or you can check out the website. If that's how you found this in the first place, then you're in luck. As for those who are normally here, as I suspect most of you are, hello and good morning. Uh, we are in Luke today, Luke 10, 25. That's where we'll start. So if you have a Bible that you like, go to Luke 10, 25. It is October 18th, also in your books. There's the date. There's the scripture. You can find both of those. We are in a section about love. This is love for neighbor, as you will see. This is one of my favorite scriptures because I think... I could argue this is the most applicable parable Jesus tells. So I say we just jump right in. This is Luke 10, 25, and I'll go through 37 in the NIV. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, on, he went to him excuse me, and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he, went, or then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So, uh, yes, that was very cold coffee. Um, I'll be drinking water from now on. All right, so the Good Samaritan. Great. Uh, can't tell you how many children's books, sermons, Bible studies. This is, you'll probably hear a lot of similar information that you've heard all your life, but still so worth hearing and such a good story it's so, for so many reasons. We'll get into it, but uh, this is what the introduction says. Late in September 2018, Joshua Mason and his girlfriend Katie Davis flew from Texas to Colorado. The next day, Joshua took Katie on a hike in the mountains northwest of Denver. After hiking about eight miles, they reached the nearly 13,000 foot summit of Jasper Peak. Joshua was hoping to find an isolated and beautiful spot to pop the question. Jasper Peak provided such a location, and Katie said yes to the surprise proposal. But then things took a turn. Because they didn't have the trailhead till about noon, and the trail to Jasper Peak isn't clearly marked, the newly engaged couple became lost and disoriented when it started to get dark. Far from cell phone service, they weren't equipped or dressed to camp overnight in the cold of the high country, and they only had a little water. Coming to a cliff and unable to go any further, they began yelling for help. About midnight, a camper who was hiking in the area heard their screams. When he discovered Joshua and Katie, they were showing signs of altitude sickness and severe dehydration. He led them to a group of his friends who were camping at a nearby lake. The campers provided the couple with water, food, and shelter in their, oh, in their tent, trying to help them get warm. But recognizing the seriousness of the situation, one of the campers hiked down to her vehicle and drove to where she could, find, she could call 911. Rescue crews reached Joshua and Katie about 4.30 a.m. Determining that they needed to move to a lower altitude immediately, the rescuers escorted them down to the trailhead. This story includes several Good Samaritans who went out of their way to help Joshua and Katie. Today, we will consider the scripture passage that prompted that now common term. There's a, a, I thought this was going to be a different story that I remember hearing that happened. It might not have happened recently. Maybe that's why. Well, basically, this guy was, we, actually, I feel like we talked about this recently. I'm, maybe I'm crazy. There's a story of a guy that was climbing Mount Everest, and he was on his way up, and he was very near the top when he saw somebody who was, effectively dying because when you get to the top that's when it gets really dangerous with sudden storms and cold and altitude and all this and instead of reaching the summit he grabbed that guy and turned around to save his life 
Uh, that also good example of a good Samaritan. That's why I thought it was going, but this is a good story too. <laughs> Either way, it's a good mountain story of good Samaritans. So context for the lesson for Luke 10. In this gospel, Luke recounts Jesus's ministry in three major sections. Events in and around Galilee, which is Luke 4 through 414 through 950. Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, 951 to 1944. And three, the events of Jesus' final week in Jerusalem, 1945 through 2453. Luke's gospel is unique in its central section, which begins shortly before our lesson text. The majority of the parable found in Luke, parables found in Luke, are located in the section, the first being the parable in our text. A primary theme of Jesus' ministry in Judea was God's love for the lost and lowly. Uh, sinners, Luke 15, outcasts, 14, 15 through 24, Samaritans, and the poor, 16, 19 through 31. Jesus' countercultural teaching in last week's lesson text, Luke 6, 27 through 36, challenged us to demonstrate inclusive love even toward our enemies. Today's text calls us to, once again to practice inclusive love. In the passage just prior to our text, 10, 1 through 24, Jesus sent out 72 of his followers in pairs to proclaim through word and deed that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Both Jesus and his 72 emissaries rejoined as God's power, uh, rejoiced <laughs> at God's power working through them. Immediately preceding our lesson passage, Jesus spoke with his 72 followers at the conclusion of their fruitful mission, uh, Luke 10, 17 through 20. Although some commentators view Jesus's interaction with, the ex with this expert in the law as an interruption of his debriefing discussion with the disciples, the exact time and place of this scene is unspecified. This parable is unique to Luke, but its subject matter and setting are similar to texts found in Matthew and Mark. Matthew 22, 34 through 40 and Mark 12, 28 to 34 are clearly parallel to one another, but the connection to Luke is less certain. Uh, the Lucan event appears to be a separate incident covering the same theme. Yeah. Well covered. Uh, but I think that, yeah, like I said, that covers enough that we can jump right in to 25. So Luke 25, Luke 10, 25, starting with the first half of that verse, which says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So the commentary, this expert in the law was a scholar educated in the Old Testament law and the Jewish tradition surrounding it. The fact that the law expert stood up indicates that Jesus was speaking and his listeners were sitting. This was a typical respectful pose when listening to a rabbi teach. The idea of testing is the same as in Jesus's temptation, uh, which is Luke 4, which can be appropriately, uh, appropriately also considered a test. Evidently, the expert in the law wasn't sincerely seeking to be taught by Jesus as much as he was interested in how Jesus would answer. We have to wonder if this man was hoping to show up Jesus. I don't think we have to wonder. I think that's pretty, I mean, if he's standing up to test Jesus, I think that's pretty clear language. He's clearly trying to pull one over on this teacher. So he's sitting listening to a rabbi teach, and he thinks he has a question that will trip up Jesus. Uh, that's, I think. I think that happens today. I think students all the time think, ooh, I have a good one that I'm going to try and stump them. People do that. That happens. Uh, so I think the question isn't, was he trying to show up Jesus? I think the question is, was his intention to be, uh, look how smart I am by tripping up Jesus, or uh, look, this man is blaspheming? Like, what, what was his intentions? Both are bad, but one is just, I want to look good, and the other one is, I want to have proof that I can show to arrest Jesus because that's an expert of the law was kind of doing that to Jesus the whole time. So again, the question isn't, was he trying, but why was he trying? So 25B, teacher, he said, uh, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So by calling Jesus teacher, the law expert at least wanted to give the impression that he respected Jesus. His question conveyed a perspective of salvation by works. Yet his response to Jesus' own question showed that the man knew that mere works without faith are dead. Uh, and that's a New Testament thing, but it's true still. Uh, the scholar's question likely has its basis in the connection between obedience to the law and gifts of inheritance and life, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 16 through 25. In the Old Testament, obedience to God is often associated with his blessing, while rebellion against him is similarly associated with curses. The law expert may have wanted to be able to identify Jesus with either the Sadducees, who denied any resurrection of the dead, or the Pharisees, who emphasis on keeping the law frequently resulted in outward actions that did not reflect a heart yielded to God. The law expert would be well acquainted with both groups and likely had some level of affiliation with one or the other. I mean, I can't stress how well put that is, how well put this whole 
commentary on 25B is. Yeah, teacher is a normal salutation, even if you disagree with, I mean, it's like if you disagree with somebody that's in power and you call them sir, even if you disagree with them, you'd still say like Mr. Roberts. I don't know. I'm throwing out names. Uh, Mr. Obanion. <laughs> Maybe you have no respect for me and don't like me. Uh, but to be respect or respectful in class, you'd be like, oh, Mr. Obanion, I have a question. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, so, yeah, he's just like, Rabbi, hey, teacher, talk to me. And, yeah, that's kind of the, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and therefore didn't really believe in eternal life. And, honestly, Judaism doesn't really have this fleshed out idea of paradise. Um, I think you can see that change throughout time in Judaism. Um, I think, yeah, you can even hear different teachings from rabbis on that point. Uh, if you went to YouTube and typed in rabbi teaches heaven and hell or rabbi teaches eternal life, you'd find different responses to this question. So that's kind of where he's at. He's like, well, there's a lot of rabbis teaching a lot of different things. You, Jesus, teach me about how to inherit eternal life trying to get him caught up and get pigeonholed into Pharisee, Sadducee, Zealot, Essene, something like that. Those are all four different kind of subsects of Judaism at this time. So that's what he's trying to do. Um, anyhow, again, well put by the commentator. 26, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? So instead of answering immediately, Jesus asked his own question. questions. Given the fact that the question is a Jewish scholar, the questioner is a Jewish scholar. It is fitting that Jesus asked him how he how he read and interpreted the law. Yeah, I mean, that's really a, it's a question not for like, he's basically saying, okay, well, you're asking me this question. Well, what does the Bible say? Like, what is the old, what is the, the law is really the Old Testament. Like that's what he, or the, especially the first five books, the Torah. Uh, so he's saying, what does, what does God say about eternal life? Like, what does it say, what does it say in there? You, as again, it's if you asked me, uh, what's what's your opinion about? Um, oh gosh, what's your opinion about the end times? I would reference. I wouldn't just start spouting off my own theories. I would point to you to Revelation and Daniel and maybe a little Ezekiel, but still, I'd be pointing to the Bible. Uh, if you said, "How do you feel about grace and?" God's love, I'd find something in here, uh, in the Bible, and show that to you. So this is a pretty easy response, uh, not easy, but a smart response for sure from Jesus. Teacher, how do I interpret, or how do I inherit eternal life? How, what, gosh dang it, how do you read the Bible? How do you, uh, what scriptures can you reference about eternal life? Good question. Anyway, 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the scholar's reply alludes to the great Shema of Deuteronomy 6.5, which Jews recited daily and still do. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. To that legal expert adds, to that, the legal expert adds the law of neighbor love found in Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. These answers showed that the scholar knew mere rule keeping was not the path to life. Instead, love of God expressed as love for neighbor leads to life. This combination of loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself has become known as the great commandment. Uh, Yeah. Love God, love people. That's basically what the teacher of the law is saying. He says we need to love God. We need to love people. It's also very important to realize uh, that they add one here, you know, heart, soul, and strength heart, soul, strength, and mind, which is different. And I know I've taught this probably ad nauseum. I already wrote on the board. Ooh, look at this nice space. I didn't even realize it was behind me. That's nice. Well, I knew it was behind me. I just didn't know you could see it. Uh, The first part of the Shema, I'm going to kind of go off camera so I can draw a little person here. Um, Another, I think I drew a gingerbread man last week too. Well, there's a little gingerbread man. Can you still, you can hear me, right? Hey, I'm here. Uh, So, the Shema is important because it's recited by Jews uh, all the time. And Shema, S-H-E-M-A, is actually the Jewish word for hear. So that's because the Shema starts with hear, O Israel, your God is one. Uh, hear, O Israel, God, the Lord is your God, the God is one. I can't remember how it goes right off the top of my head. But basically Shema means hear, uh, hear, O Israel. And so... I think what's important to see from Deuteronomy is heart, soul, and strength. And I've always 
understood that as kind of a radiating sense. So it's like heart is first, soul is second, and then strength is last. Because they had this idea that your heart was kind of in, the, in your core. That was your center. And then your soul was more of an ethereal all over. And then your strength was your physical body. So it was going out. Adding your mind, though, is interesting. Because the mind doesn't really come into play until, ugh. You could argue a couple Eastern, Eastern philosophers had an idea of an ethereal mind. Not ethereal, but like the presence of the mind separate from the self. Uh, but that was probably later. So I would argue it was more of a Greco, a Greek philosophy. The idea of mind, have, your mind having having power or your mind having your mind meaning something because in ancient world and in the old testament times it was heart and your heart was like your guts your center and they believed in like a soul which i mean like <laughs> again i'm going to use the word ethereal kind of a essence a, pre, a a very essence of yourself kind of thing uh and then your physical body but to ha add the mind is a is a shoot of kind of a Greek philosophy, of a, a newer philosophy compared to what the Old Testament teaches. Um, ultimately, does that matter to the teaching? Probably not. But I think it's interesting that he, that in this scripture, in Luke, the teacher of the law adds it. Uh, it's fascinating. But, and where he adds it, like you would think it'd be heart, mind, soul, and strength, again, radiating out, but he just adds it at the end. Not, probably, again, probably not interesting to anybody else but me, <laughs> but it's still, he, it's, it's more interesting for the history of philosophy. Um, at what point did a Jewish rabbi learn a philosophy of the mind or learn that there is a mind or a brain to consider in the process and kind of not add it to scripture, but supplant it onto the Shema, heart, soul, mind, and, or heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which is important. So yeah, these are the greatest commandments. Love God, love people. 28, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. So easy, it's done. Jesus, Jesus' seemingly final word to the law expert was this com commendation of the man's correct answer. Hey, you did it, guy. That's all you need to do. Love God and love people. You did it. But he's not satisfied because he's a teacher of the law and he thinks that he needs to get this Jesus guy once more. Uh... But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? I like that word justify. Well, they'll get into it. The expert in the law found himself challenged and so looked to justify himself, although the man acknowledged previously that Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself, is a summary statement of the law. He took advantage of the ambiguity of the word neighbor. In the original context of Leviticus 19.18, love for neighbors is love for fellow Israelites, although that love was to be extended to any foreigner who came to Israel from other land and lived among them. The land of Israel in Jesus' day under Roman occupation was comprised of many who were not Israelites. With his question, the scholar clearly seemed to be trying to create a distinction, making the point that some people are neighbors and thus required to be loved, and some people are not. The notion that some people are not neighbors is what Jesus addressed in this parable. Yeah, this is a classic, like this is what you, th when somebody thinks of like slimy lawyer, like, ooh, he's a lawyer, so he like twists your words and that kind of thing. This is exactly what I think of. This is like, oh yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes, huh, well, who is my neighbor? Do you mean just next door? Or do you mean like people who are like my kin? Do you mean people who I like? What's neighbor even mean? Uh, and so he's trying to justify what he's basically, he's like, well, I've loved other Israelites and I've loved my family, but I definitely haven't loved Romans. And I definitely haven't loved people coming into Israel from other countries. So do I, what does neighbor mean? Jesus, he's trying to like, I, I loved some people, so what does that mean? So he's really trying to get Jesus to say, now you're good. Yeah, he's, he heard, he, he, basically he's, he, Jesus said, you are correct. Like he, he's trying to trip up Jesus. How do I inter inherit inter eternal life? Jesus says, well, what does it say in the Bible? He says, love God and love people. Jesus says, nailed it, done. And he goes, oh, wait, the, the, the law expert's like, oh, wait, I haven't done that. So how do I? 
how do I justify this even more? How do I get make sure that I am correct again? So he asks. That's where we get into the bulk of this. So 30, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So rather than answering the scholar's question directly, Jesus told a story. Like other Jewish teachers in his time, Jesus used a parable to explain a scripture text, in this case, Leviticus 19.18. Since the details of parables were true to life, we can increase our our understanding of the parable by exploring the historical and cultural contexts. Supporting it. (laughs) Although Jesus' Jesus' audience likely assumed the opening character had been a Jew, Jesus never specified his identity. The man remains anonymous throughout the story. Since Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level and Jericho is about 800 feet below sea level, a traveler sitting out from Jerusalem certainly would have gone down to Jericho. Uh, winding its way through rocky desert, the 17-mile road was infamous for its danger. The caves along the way presented robbers with opportunities to ambush travelers. Jesus focused on the violent mistreatment the man received at the hands of the robbers. They were not content to simply take his clothes. The robbers left him half dead. One would hope that these evildoers were the only characters in the parable to show such callous disdain for human life. Yeah, I mean, they nailed it. Uh, Jericho is like... (laughs) Right there. So this is... If, if you didn't gather yet, this is Israel. Uh, this is Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea, obviously Red Sea down here, Egypt's over here. We'll get into why Babylonia and Assyria are labeled uh, Edom, Moab, Ammon, Aaron, Aram, and then this would be Jerusalem. So if you're in, Jer- in if you're, or did I say Jerusalem? This is Israel, if I didn't say that right. Uh, But yeah, Jerusalem is, there's a reason why it's called the Holy Hill. It's on a hill. It's on top. It has a strategic location where every way you go, every way you go to it, you're going up. Even if you're heading south, you're going up to Jerusalem. And so that's why there's uh, in the Psalms. And if I could remember which ones they are, that'd be awesome. But I can't Uh, watch me find them really quick. Am I going to do it? I'm not going to do it. Uh, there's a group of psalms in psalms called the Psalms of Ascent because they would sing them. Uh, Jewish people. Ah, ha, 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 oh, I'm so happy I found them. I can never remember if they're in the 120s or where they're at. Um, does it start in 119, though? 119 is really long. No, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. So starting in 120, Psalm 120. And going through to, man, I wish I could remember how long these are. Going to 134. So for 14 psalms, there's songs of ascent. So you would sing these when heading to Jerusalem for festivals. You would literally, like, this was kind of a group activity. As you walk up to Jerusalem, at a certain point, you start singing the songs of ascent because you're ascending to Jerusalem. And that's because you go down every time. So that's, first of all, well put. Uh, second of all, yeah, that context of, they don't tell you who this man is. Like they don't tell you, Jesus doesn't say, uh, a leader of the temple, uh, a tax collector, a farmer, (laughs) a fisherman. He doesn't say a Babylonian, a Roman, a Greek, a Grecian. I don't know how you pronounce it, how you'd say that. A Spanish man. He doesn't say anything. He just says, there's a man. There was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, when he was attacked. And yeah, this this road uh, is treacherous. That is a that is one way to go, man. That, it's, I mean, it's, I, did they say how, it's like 17 miles? Yeah, it's 17 miles and it's like, what, 1,900 feet down? Like, that's, that's an ascent. That's quick. So anyway, uh, keep it going. 31 through 32. A priest happened to be going down the same road uh, when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So priests, who were descendants of Levi and Aaron, served as God's representative to the people. Levites served as assistants to priests. So why didn't these servants of God serve the wounded man? Some speculate that they feared that whoever attacked the man was lurking nearby and might attack them as well. Or perhaps they feared becoming ritually unclean and thus unable to fulfill their religious duties by touching what appeared to be a dead body. 
The latter argument has been countered by geography. To go down from Jerusalem indicated that they had completed their temple responsibilities and were heading home. In addition, the Jewish practice was to bury a dead person on the same day. This should have compelled both priest and Levite to investigate the victim's status with regard to that requirement. But before getting too deep into the weeds of speculative mind reading, we remind ourselves that this is a fictional story, a parable to make a point. Since no motive is stated by Jesus, there is no motive to be discerned. The characters of negligent priest and Levite serve as the stark backdrop to what comes next. Yeah, this, it doesn't matter why they ignored him. It matters that they ignored him. And it matters who they are. Because the priest is, like it says here, a rep God's representative to the people. Um, and a Levite is basically like, you can almost call them deacons. Like they, they assist the priest, but they help maintain the temple. They do a lot of like upkeep and cleaning and different things like that. So the Levites are more hands-on while the priests are more kind of what you'd consider like a preacher kind of thing, I would say. Uh, but um, man, excuse me. So these are high up people. These are important figures in Judaism. And so to say that this expert in the law, who, if you're an expert in the law, in the Jewish law, you're most likely a Jewish person. So this, he's talking to this Jewish expert in law and he says, a priest who's supposed to represent, uh, who's supposed to go to God as a represent, wait, he's supposed to go to the people as a representative of God and the man that, and a man that has devoted his life to taking care of the temple and therefore the people and the way they sacrifice and worship God. These two very important people in Jewish culture and religion and life completely ignore this man. Just not only ignore him, they cross to the other side and keep going because they don't want to even, they don't even want him to brush up against their cloak. They want to just get down the road. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter if they thought maybe they were in danger. It doesn't matter if they thought, well, I won't be able to go to temple later if I'm unclean for a couple days, anything like that. None, none of that matters. It matters that these are important people that are just ignoring them. So we get to this. 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. So when the northern kingdom of Israel was exiled to Assyria centuries earlier, some Israelites were left behind. The intermarriage of these Israelites with the Gentiles who were brought into the land resulted in the population known as Samaritans. The Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch and asserted that God must be worshipped on Mount Gerizim rather than Jerusalem. Excuse me. The Jews in Jesus' day despised the Samaritans and refused to associate with them. And, of course, the feelings were mutual. Needless to say, a Samaritan would be the last person, excuse me, a Jew would expect to show pity to another Jew. Uh, yeah, so that's very concise for what the kind of cultural and historical context of what's going on here. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. So I, that's why I drew this on the board. So when the kingdom splits after, not Solomon, Rehoboam. Jeroboam. There's two Boams, and I can never remember which one came first. Solomon's son was either Rehoboam or Jeroboam. I can't remember which one right now. Either way, after, after David came Solomon, and after Solomon came Solomon's son, and Solomon's son saw the kingdom split apart. So there was a northern kingdom, and, which was called Israel, and a southern kingdom called Judea, Judah or Judea. And so as Judah, it's Judea later, because that's a Romanized, Greco-Romanized word. The capital of Israel was Samaria after Omri uh, came, and then Jerusalem always stayed the capital of Judah. So the southern kingdom remained mostly faithful throughout the rest of its time uh, up until it became not faithful and was taken away. And then uh, the northern kingdom was almost always unfaithful. It wasn't a good situation in northern Israel uh, or in Israel. And so the Assyrians came pretty quick for them in the context of all of history. That's, but it's well put, but needs kind of restated and structured a little better. So yeah, so the Assyrians were like up here. Uh, you can't really see where I am. Oh man, I wish you could. So up this way, that's all you got. Uh, the Assyrian empire was huge. When it came in, it, <clears throat> it's amazing. History is amazing, I love history. The Babylonians and the Assyrians, did totally different things when they conquered a, a nation. So Assyria came and took over Israel. And what they did is they took all the people, or as many people as they could, the good, the 
strong, the smart, the wealthy, all those people, they took them, and instead of shipping them to Assyria, they took them and they put them, I wonder if I can have another pen that works. That, eh, that doesn't work very great, and it doesn't erase. Dang it, oh well, it's fine. Uh, so they took the, the Israelites, and they spread them all throughout their kingdom. Instead of taking the, the, the um, prisoners back to Assyria, back to the capital, back to wherever, they took them and spread them out, and they left some behind to just kind of be citizens of this new Assyrian region. So they took the strong, the ones that would cause trouble because they could unite, uh, that had wealth, that had power, anything like that, and sent them away. This is what's known as the diaspora uh, because that means that they're, it basically it's those that are spread out. They, they came, it's the lost tribes of Israel. They came and they were spread out throughout Assyria and we don't really hear from them anymore. So Assyria left some behind and as it says, when these were let, not only when they were sent away and left some Israelites behind, other Assyria sent other captives from other regions that they had taken over and sent them to Israel. So it was this idea that when we capture somebody, instead of letting them stay in one spot and then kind of start thinking about rebellion, we'll ship them out, send new people in. And so it's kind of like this disorienting, I was taken over. Uh, we fought a war, we lost, and now I'm getting sent to another region where I have to intermarry and just live my life under Assyrian rule. It's very fascinating kind of tactics of war and governing. But because of that, the Jewish religion was still so strong here that the intermarried people remained faithful to Judaism to an extent because their intermarriage, they actually started to morph in all these different kinds of Assyrian philosophies and uh, all these different ways to worship and, and so on and so on to the point where it became uh, a t almost, almost a different religion. They followed the Pentateuch, but that was it. They didn't follow anything outside of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was the only five books they read, and they believed that their mountain, their holy hill, was different than where Jerusalem was. So effectively, when the Assyrians took over, and after Greece, after... Oh, gosh. Iguanas eat apples. Ba after Babylon, per after Persia, Greece, now we're in Rome, Samaria became kind of its own, like, sub-region within here. And then there was this kind of nebulous northern sphere, which is where Jesus is from. That's Bethlehem. That's the Sea of Galilee. That's all that up there is, is kind of the northern place. And so in between with Samaria, you see this a lot like John 4. In John 4, Jesus is up here and he has to get down to Judah. He has to get down to Jerusalem. And good Jewish people hated Samaritans so much that they would walk around Samaria to get to Jerusalem. And John 4, he tells his disciples, no, we're going to go through Samaria. Like we're going to go through there. We, those are our people. Like we're going through. And so that's when he goes through there and he meets uh, the woman at the well. John 4, great example of Jesus and grace. You should read that later. So that's Samaritans. That's why this is so such a big deal. Like, because, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's why this is such a big deal. Because when Babylonia, when Babylon came and took over the southern kingdom, they did the opposite of what Assyria did. They took all of their prisoners, left some behind, but took all of their prisoners and as a group sent them to Babylon. So the, some, the Israel, the northern kingdom, got shipped out all over the place, intermarried, all this stuff. The southern kingdom, as one group, went to Babylon, stayed here for a, stayed down there for a while, and then that's when we read that uh, books like Ezra, Nehemiah, um, Esther, 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 things like this. That all happens in Babylon as they are allowed to be their own group. They're, they're a Jewish contingent in Babylon, and they're allowed their freedom after Persia takes over, and they come back into Judea. They come back into Judah, and so they never lost their religious, racial, uh, cultural identity. They kept it, and so that's why they consider themselves this, like, lofty higher up. They are Jews that survived. They're a Jewish group that was exiled and came back while this group is this intermarried kind of, I, they would, 
the North was kind of like this idea of like the American South where it's like, oh, those are like hillbillies. Those are, those are inbred people. We don't talk about them. They're, this is some other that we don't discuss. But they hated each other for that because they're, cons- from considering the Southern people considered the Samaritans irreligious, blasphemous, uh, again, just kind of half-blooded, ugh, nothings. And so this was a heated rivalry. I mean, this isn't like, this isn't Hatfield McCoy. Uh, this isn't Montagues and Capulets. This isn't anything like that. This is borderline war. This is modern day Israel versus Syria or Israel versus Jordan. This is intense infighting. Uh, one time, I think before Jesus was born, Samaritans came to Jerusalem, went into the temple, and they threw human bones into the temple, which immediately, uh, I mean, you're not allowed to touch a dead body or have dead things touch you. And so to throw human bones into the temple was to desecrate the temple in a shocking level. I mean, to throw, I mean, imagine somebody throwing real life human bones in this church. I mean, you'd be like, that's really gross and inappropriate. And you would question things, but you might have grace for them. This was like, we have this, and this was during Passover. So this was like the biggest, highest, most important Jewish festival of the year. And Samaritans threw human bones into the temple to desecrate the temple. And so they had to shut down Passover. They had to shut down the temple. They had to make sacrifices and clean and do all this insane stuff. This was a big heated thing. Like this was a rivalry beyond what we can, beyond really what we have today. So all that to say, uh, when Jesus is telling this story and he's talking to an expert of the law, this is a Jewish man from the Southern kingdom who knows the law knows the Old Testament forwards and backwards. He knows it well enough to not only quote the Shema, but to quote other scriptures when saying, how do I inherit eternal life? Like he has an answer for that when he doesn't have the Bible in his phone. Like he knows right off the top of his head what to say. He is a smart guy and therefore he is a, he is conscious of what this is. Like he knows everything going on here. And Jesus says, a priest and a Levite ignore him, but a Samaritan has pity on this man. This is a big deal, big deal. That's the important thing to take away. So 34, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. So in stark contrast to the inactivity of the priest and the Levite, the Samaritan actively ministered to the needy man. Both Jews and Greeks appeared to have used wine and oil widely for medicinal purposes. Excuse me. Wine would have been used to clean the man's wounds, the alcohol having an antiseptic effect. Olive oil would ease the man's pain. The Samaritans then put on put the man on his own oh the Samaritan then put the man on his own donkey, which means he himself now had to walk. Ends were places of potential danger, not just for theft, but also potentially murder. But from beginning to end, the Samaritan considered the care of the injured man of greater value than the risk involved. Yeah, this is a lot. Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, so Oil and wine is like a medicinal thing. That, that's well put. I'm not going to really put it. It's also probably a really good salad dressing. That's more of an aside. If you mix oil and really it's vinegar, but when you have wine and casks like they did, they're pretty close to vinegar. It's not a half bad, not a half bad salad dressing. Uh, but he salad dresses it. That's a, actually, that, there's a joke there. He dresses his wounds and it could make a salad dressing. There's something there. We're going to workshop that together. Uh, so he takes care of his wounds, and then he puts him on his donkey and leads him and brings him to an inn. So, yeah, this is also important to notice that uh, it doesn't say the Samar- if the Samaritan's going down to Jericho or up to Jerusalem. But either way, this is a rocky, treacherous road, lots of danger. And he, instead of riding on his donkey, he has to walk this up or like crazy steep hill with a man on his donkey and he has to walk and make sure he doesn't fall off and make sure the donkey's good and get to an inn. This is an intense act of sacrifice. So verse 35 then, 
The next day, when he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, uh, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Some scholars estimate that two denarii would have been sufficient for two months of room and board in an inn. By entering such an open-ended arrangement, the innkeeper, with the innkeeper, the Samaritan was running the risk of being a victim himself, of extortion. As Jonathan interceded with his father, King Saul, on David's behalf, behalf, sorry, lesson five, here the Samaritan intercedes on the wounded man's behalf. Both Jonathan and the Samaritan demonstrate a faithful love, Jonathan in the context of an existing covenant, and the Samaritan in his obvious regard for human life. Yeah, you could almost argue that if you're... You could argue, not from the Samaritan point of view, but from ours, by us making a covenant with Jesus that will follow through with what he put forth. If we did this in the same, if we did the same thing, took care of an injured man on the side of the road like this, we would be honoring a covenant that we made with Jesus. That's more of a preaching point that I could make, but still. <clears throat> Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? So having finished his parable, Jesus countered the law expert's question with one of his own. The man had asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus changed the question and shifted the focus to who acted like a neighbor. In Jesus' view, trying to identify whom one is called to love is an obvious attempt to relinquish responsibility. To do so is to reveal one's motivation of trying to find ways to avoid obeying God rather than embracing the call to love God as, or to love as God loves. What I love that ver uh, that line, uh, in Jesus' view, trying to identify whom one is called to love is an obvious attempt to relinquish, relinquish responsibility. Yeah, who do I need to love? That's, uh, that's a very clear, I don't want to love everybody, so who is it that I love? <laughs> that's good. Uh, so yeah, he, he asked which of these uh, acted most like a neighbor, to which... He says in 37a, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. The expert in the law cannot bring himself to say the word Samaritan. So good. As a Jew, he couldn't fathom the notion of a good Samaritan. But at least the man grasped the point of Jesus' parable, recognizing the mercy and action that set the Samaritan apart from the priest and the Levite. Just as the law expert gave the right answer in the first exchange, so he answers correctly here. However, his refusal, his refusal to name the Samaritan likely reveals that, in his heart, this man still considers some people neighbors and others unworthy of that relationship. Yeah, clearly. I mean, if you can't even say the word Samaritan to mean that's the person that's being a neighbor, yeah, your heart's probably not in the right place. I don't think he was being... I, I don't think he was just... I think this was a bad answer on purpose. Like, I think he was, I think this is spot on that he's, that I think it's spot on that he can't say Samaritan. I don't think that's reading too much into it. I think that this man cannot bring himself to say that that was a Samaritan that was a neighbor. He cannot do it. Um, and again, I cannot express enough how contentious, how insane this story would be to this man to hear that a Samaritan, somebody who is so lesser than him, is a good neighbor. Uh, so Jesus, we'll keep going in 37b. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So here's Jesus' final word. The lawyer appeared to be hoping that he could limit his responsibility by being a neighbor to only a select few. With this profound parable, Jesus conveyed that rather than calculating who is a neighbor and who is not, the expert in the law should heed Jesus' call to be a neighbor to whoever crossed his path. This is, why, this is the only reference to this man in the Bible. We don't know how he responded to Jesus in the gospel later on. He heard Jesus' message. Did he embrace it and act on it? Did he remember it whenever a foul joke was told about Samaritans or he encountered one on the road to Jericho? Question mark. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so at the beginning I said, I think this is the most applicable sermon or applicable parable that Jesus tells because the phrasing of it is so interchangeable. Jesus says a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan are the ones that you need to focus on this. In any time in history, you can equate these three to something else. In any culture, in any region, anywhere, you can make these three apply. We could do, um, we could just do this church uh, on the way to, on the way to lunch, a man was beaten and robbed on the way to Wichita. 
uh, on the side of the road. And on the way, uh, Nick Pannone saw him and just kept driving. On the way, Sam O'Banion saw him and just kept, kept driving. But also on the way was, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of who would be a pariah here. Um, a, I don't know, an unchurched, oh, here's a good one. Okay, I got it. You ready for this? A man is beaten and robbed on the way to Wichita. Nick Pannone passes him and doesn't pay him any attention. Sam O'Banion passes him and doesn't pay him any attention. But a, uh, a, oh man, I'm trying to think of a good one. A young man, I don't even, I'm trying to think of a good thing that sets people apart in Derby specifically, or even in this church. Basically just an unchurched person finds him and takes care of him to the best of their ability. That's basically what you got to do for this church. I mean, you can, again, you can do this for a lot of things. Uh, I'm not doing so well at it right now, but you can do it for a lot of things. Um, you could say a man was beaten uh, on the road somewhere and um, a Republican passed him and didn't do anything. A Democrat passed him and didn't do anything, but a socialist did. You'd be like, whoa, wait, that's too far. Yeah. Uh, you could do, he was heading down and a pastor passed him, a <laughs> pastor passed him. That's good. Uh, a Christian pastor walked by him, a Christian elder passed by him, but a Muslim stopped and helped him. That's it. Basically it's anything that is antithesis to what not only you expect, but also against kind of the religious legalism, right? It's the idea that here are these people that are claiming God, right? Priests and Levites. These are the people that are supposed to be closest to God. The people that are honoring God the most with what they do and what they say, not actually honoring God with what they do and say. This is, they're paying lip service to this faith. When here's this man that is despised, that doesn't even really believe the things that Jewish people believe. Like he's not really, he's not really a Jew. He only believes in the first five books of the Bible. Like that's not, that's not a Jewish person. That's just, that's somebody that's cherry picking. He thinks that they worship on Mount Gerizim. They have all these different traditions and feasts and different things because they assimilated with Assyrians. They don't, they're not Jews. They're not really anything. They're kind of pseudo Jewish pagans. And yet he's the one that stopped, not the priest, not the Levite, not the Christian pastor, not the Republican, not the, um, not the deacon, not the uh, man, I'm trying to think, not the longtime Christian, not the worship pastor, the senior adults pastor, but it was this guy that doesn't really believe in anything. It was this guy that honestly, oftentimes is actually against what we teach, against what I believe. He's the one that stopped. And so that's why this is the most applicable. Cause it's like, we aren't in this story. We aren't the Samaritan. We're we're being almost equated to the priests unless we live a Samaritan life, right? We're, this is religious people against an irreligious person that's doing good and doesn't realize they're glorifying God in that. See what I'm saying? That's why it's the most applicable because it's so important to remember, like we need to be like the Samaritan. Like we can be churched, like we can be godly people, like a priest and a Levite and a pastor and a longtime churchgoer, but we can't be so much so that we start being legalistic, that we start ignoring people that are in need. Uh, I don't, I'm, I don't think a lot of us do. I think as a church in general, like South Rock, we're actually pretty good at that. Um, but it's this, but again, it's, yeah, I think that's important, but it's also amazing that the story isn't about the, uh, the story is about the Samaritan being a good neighbor it's not about being a good neighbor to the Samaritan, but it is. It's so, it's, it's so interesting how Jesus did this. Basically, he was saying the Samaritan was a good neighbor, but he was a good neighbor to an unnamed man, right? right? Like, you need to be a good neighbor to the Samaritan because he's good or because he's a man, but you also need to be a good neighbor to the man that's laying half down on the side of the road. Like, he's laying half down on the side of the road, beaten, probably wouldn't be recognizable, right? Uh, you wouldn't be able to tell if he's a Jew or a Greek or a Roman, okay, he's beaten in half, he's naked and beaten. So you might be able to tell, depending, 
I won't get into that. But you like you're just seeing this bloody pulp of a man that's been robbed of everything he has, and so you need to be a good neighbor to him. You need to be a good neighbor to the person that's taking care of him. He's basically saying there's no limit to who your neighbor is. You just need to go show mercy to everyone. Oh man, there's you could teach. I could preach a 10 week ser- sermon series just on these 12 verses. <laughs> there's so much to pull out of them. Who's a good neighbor? What does it mean to be a good neighbor? What is the antithesis of good neighbor? Ugh, man, there's a lot to really focus in on. But let me end the, by saying this. The most important part is go and do likewise. Go and show mercy to him. Go and show mercy to the ones in need. That's the most important part. All this is really good in telling and shows kind of the hypocrisy of what being legalistic in your religion can look like. But ultimately what the point of the story is, love God and love people and go do that. Go be merciful to people. Like we, I I think Nick and I talked about this a lot in our long form Bible study, excuse me, called crosstalk. But love is this thing that's not, love isn't a feeling. Like we, we in our society and culture today make love out to be this like, oh, I just don't, I don't feel like I love her anymore. And that's not really what love is. Love, love is a feeling, but you can go love someone. <laughs> you can, when the Bible says go and love someone, it doesn't say go and feel mushy, mushy, like, oh, I love them. It means go and wash their feet. Go and build build something for them. Go and feed them and clothe them. Go love them. And that's he's saying the Samaritan was a good neighbor. He loved people because he went and did something for them. He he pulled him onto his donkey and went and made sure he was safe and healthy and well. And so he's saying love and mercy is what you need to go do for people. Uh, go and do likewise. So I think that's it. This is probably a longer one. I love this story, though. There's so much to unpack about what a Samaritan is and what Jesus means. And, man, again, it's just so applicable to our lives because you can take out Levite, priest, and Samaritan and put plug and play three different ones, and it'll always mean the same thing uh, if you, barring you're not doing it right or barring you doing it wrong. Anyhow, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, bold, salacious attempts to tell me I'm wrong, you can contact me at samuelo at southrockchristian.com, uh, or you can call the church, 788-5503. I'm here Monday through Thursday, and I'm always looking forward to questions. As always, cannot wait for this room to be full of people to challenge me and ask me questions and talk and laugh and have a good time. So, all right. Hopefully this video finds you well. Uh, I will see you next week. Bye.